Thanks for staying with us on News Hub and welcome in case you've just joined us. You've missed a lot, but I mean, the program's still on course. We're still celebrating Nigeria at 61. Some people would say, what are we celebrating? What others would say, well, there is a lot to celebrate. Our focus today on the show is on politics and policies since 1960 and perhaps 1999 till date. We want to talk about our, our democracy in place. Let's let you know that we've been joined by a professor of political economy as well as a management expert. Is no known person, she's no new person to you because it's someone that you know all the time and whose uh, you know, perspective always, always uh, you know, makes sense to those who know. Uh, join us this morning as we uh, welcome Professor Pat Utomi. Prof, so nice to have you in the studios. Uh, we're so sorry we brought you out this early morning. Well, thank you. I'm we thank you. We thank you so much. We do have with us uh, Ibufiri Bob Manuel, who is the president of uh, uh, Rivers Entrepreneurs as well as Investors. He's in Port Harcourt as well as Abuja, where we have Engineer Sunny. So, uh, gentlemen, let's uh, go further. Let's, let's come to you, uh, Prof. Nigeria since 1960, and where we are today, would you have imagined this is where we should be? Not, not at all. Uh, you know, in the days when we were much younger, we thought Nigeria was the center of the universe. And we had a lot to go on. Um, at the time of independence, we began, a, or just before independence, a self-government. Nigeria began a massive program of industrialization as the new leaders who were elected with self-government uh, or appointed began to see the gap between the colonial uh, programs and where we should be going. It was a massive program of industrialization. By the time we became independent, um, the South Koreas and Kuwait were way behind us yeah. on industrialization. Uh, and that era opened with um, a kind of competitive uh, terrain where the regions were competing with who would most bring progress to their people. Um, my favorite illustrations, Western Nigeria, jumped out first with um, setting up an industrial estate, what we now know as the Keja Industrial Estate. It was the first industrial estate of that nature in the country. Not to be outdone by the West, the East started two, in Aba and Transamadi in Port Harcourt. Uh, Isadona, Premier of Northern Nigeria, responded with Kakuri in Kaduna. Bompai was already uh, growing up in Kano. When Nigeria began to surge in terms of a uh, possible industrial power. And um, education was critical to provide the know-how and know-why to support this process. Again, Western Nigeria jumped out first, universal basic primary education. Uh, Zeke going east tried to respond to uh, the Awolowo initiative. And there was a pushback from the civil servants who said, look, we don't have as much money in, in the east as, you have, as, as they have in the west. And it led to a crisis that Chief Jerome Udoji, Pam in Finance, threatened to resign. Anyway, they solved the problem eventually, and the East came up with a creative approach, which in Igbo is referred to as Ibuanye Danda, you know, that the ants, you know, sharing of the burden of the load. And so uh, the communities chipped in. The Igbo State Union became the biggest proprietor of schools back in those days, uh, of the 30 secondary schools around the country. Uh, the, uh, uh, missionaries, of course, with their part, and government with its part. The East managed to find money to start the first indigenous university in the country, the University of Nigeria. And, and that surge, that competition, was what drove Nigeria's ascendancy. Mm. Uh, of course, uh, we had the great error of a group of young military officers who saw 10% as, as Zogu called it, in the, the 10 percenters <laughs> of bribe being taken. Mm. They didn't know that the military would bring 100 percenters. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, uh, uh, and um, we went into this sad uh, era of state capture because that's the problem of Nigeria. And those who get into power capture the Nigerian state. And there's a gold displacement, public gold, at this place of private gold. Hmm. So Nigeria has not been able to gain traction. Hmm. Prof, sad, sad narrative. Okay, like, like you did say, maybe the, 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 the military boys did truncate. Uh, 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 what seemed like a direction in Nigeria that had a vision, had a direction. Then afterwards, we've had 
some sort of um, a return to what we call, um, well, one of our, our guests did call it civil rule. We would have thought um, democratic uh, dispensation would have been the proper thing, but he called it civil rule. Why haven't we been able to retrace uh, our steps to where we were at the beginning? Well, it was a fundamental error that took place in 1999. Okay. Prof, we'll come back to you in a moment. We need to fix something in just a moment. In the meantime, let's cross over to uh, uh, one of our resource persons there in Port Harcourt at this point in time. And let's bring about um, Mr. Bob Manuel. Before the break, I did ask you what you thought of uh, political parties in the country, especially uh, in, the, in, the, in their own part, because you can't talk about any democracy without talking about political parties. So let me hear your thoughts. Okay, your, your question, if I could remember, is on uh, the ideology of the political parties. Currently, I'll tell you, um, it's a far cry because the political parties don't have a clear-cut ideology, and it favors them, and that's why they could afford to run themselves the way they have. But um, the way democracy is structured, democracy is indeed um, um, a system for the people, by the people, and for the people, something around that. And so when the people don't have a buy-in into um, the ideology, you find out that there becomes a vacuum in the system. It's created, it will create a lacuna. And I believe basically that is the problem the country is faced with. And for us at the Investors Forum, what we're trying to do is to entrench these various um, um, basics, uh, spaces that we've, we've found out to see how we could uh, work with the political parties with INEC, to see how we could uh, drive such spaces in such a way that um, they, they would have buy-in by the people. We need to interrogate the political parties on their policy trust, on their ideologies and what they intend to do and how they intend to do it. And that's what we've been doing. So we're creating, um, uh, we're creating market, uh, we're, we're going out to mobilizing the different groups into market spaces to see how the market spaces should be able to get to interrogate this because we need to drive this process to the bottom. And in driving this process to the bottom, we could have a better buy-in by the people for different political parties, for different interests of theirs, to see how they could now see those political parties and those interests as the major re reason or driving force that propels them towards a particular political party. For instance, if, if a party said, we're going to do X, Y, and Z, and the party is in, in government for the past six years, and they've not been able to trace the dots to what they promised them, then the people would be able to come together and hold those political parties to ransom, to ask them, why haven't you been able to achieve this? And you're coming around to be able, you're coming around to hoodwink the people again for them to vote you. So these are the basic processes of development of our political space that we think is even more crucial beyond even the electorate, uh, electorate. Because if you don't have an enlightened people, an enlightened populace, there is no way that the political parties and the political gladiators would not have their way at will at every time. But the only way you could get the people to get by in is when they're properly informed. And that is basically why the country is still practicing a mono economy at this, at this uh, 21st century. With all the potentials Nigeria, Nigeria has, we don't have any business practicing, practicing a mono economy where we keep I mean, keep um, um, depending on just one product, being in the oil. When you find out that other developed countries had actually even transited the oil economy, other developed countries are even looking at electric and even looking at more green green sources of energy than uh, what we're, 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 we're dwelling in. So we need mass... Um, um, we need mass uh, enlightenment on our people for them to really get to understand. And I think that's the pain of the challenge that we have in our political space. That's basically where the problem is. That's why we're working with the INEC, we're working with um, different organizations, um, we're having different, um, um, yes. um, what do you call, webinars, seminars, yes. in-person programs, try to throw up all of this into the fall. And one of those um, last seminars we had uh, we, with my friend, uh, Pat Utomi, was one of our resource persons. So basically, 
we need to keep enlightening the people because All right, we have be, be a major gap between the politicians and, and uh, the, the, the electorates. Thank uh, you. Uh, yes, but Mona, th thank you so very much. I'm quite, quite insightful there. L let's come back to Prof uh, uh, so that we can, let's, let's make sure that we are all on the same level. Uh, before you came in, we are talking about party ideas and all of that. But then, so let's see how you can merge. And much the last question I asked before uh, we took that break, I did ask you, uh, why couldn't we retrace our steps to when it seemed like we had a vision. I'm sure you can also see that that has to do with ideas. There was an ideology that was, uh, that was being worked with back then. Yeah. I mean, if you talk about UPN in 1979, yeah. you knew what UPN stood for. You could tell about the focus on education, free education, you know, and stuff like that. You turn to NPN, you could tell the kinds of programs that the NPN pursued. Uh, after 1999, there was nothing, yeah. which is what I call the era of 99. In 1999, Nigeria did not transit to a democracy. It transited to machine politics, hmm. that you use a political machine to grab power for your use and your pleasure. Okay, uh, how did that happen? That happened for a variety of reasons. First, I think... General Abdusalam Abubakar, understandably, was in a hurry to just get out of the place. The military had had enough, you know. Yeah. Uh, and we were the ones who gave them that help, you know. Uh, groups like the Concerned Professionals, which yeah. I was part of. And, and they got to the point, they just wanted out. And, and they went in such a dash that things were not prepared right. Secondly, um, when they were leaving, the traditional politicians the people who followed the Azikiways, the uh, Awolowas, Sadawanas, Okbaras, the Shagaris, uh, those people kind of looked at uh, what was going on and thought, hmm, these soldiers are playing a game. One year later, they'll carry out another coup. They don't want our time to be wasted. Especially what Abtaba Bangida has uh, many turnovers, mm. you know, his presidential set of candidates, no, we'll cancel, we'll start again. So those fellows were just like, let's watch this. It turned out to be a big mistake. Because uh, some of us, the concerned professionals as we were in those days, assumed that those people will come back and get into politics and politics of service and all of that. But those people chose to watch. <laughs> and the soldiers that changed their uniforms and their bagmen mm. <laughs> entered the space. Mm. Nigeria was done. I mean, John Nigeria was finished at that point because uh, with no ideas of what to do, uh, with no clarity of how to ensure that there was order in the way you engaged the state as a political party, mm -hmm. uh, once oil prices went to the stratosphere, remember that in the last days of Abacha, oil prices were down to single digits, $9, yeah. and stuff like that. Then shortly after President Basunjo, I think so, went up. 100 and something dollar price of oil. And these young governors who used to be bag men of soldiers began to call themselves sheiks, mm. call themselves all kinds of names. So they go collect the That's FAC right. account uh, money, go straight to presidential hotel or wherever it is, they change the thing to dollars, head out of the country and start buying houses and doing all kinds of whatever it is they did. Uh, but the most dangerous thing that happened to Nigeria, the worst thing that happened to Nigeria from that whole order was that they then used money to erect barriers of entry into politics. So people who wanted to serve could not enter politics anymore because it had been monetized. Uh, I mean, what it takes to run for political office in Nigeria is a sin. And nobody who spends that kind of money will serve the people. Nobody. I don't care what you say. His first task will be to recoup his investment. And so, in many ways, the political parties became criminal enterprises. They were SPVs for those who owned them. And their purpose was to capture the state. And that's, that's the sad place where Nigeria is and must be unwound if we're going to make any progress. Um, if we, the people, 
do not get up and say enough of this. If we just continue to accept that we're done, one day God will catch them. <laughs> God is a long-suffering God. He may choose not to catch them immediately. And our children will be in serious trouble. All right, but Prof, what you've just said now will corroborate what Engineer Sonny had said earlier on that, well, since the military, you know, you know stepped into the, uh, you know, the, the civil rule that was supposed to have led us to a democracy in the country, that mm. the story has never been the same. Mm. So I, I'd like for us to deal and dwell on the political parties in the country today. Even if that is the only thing we're, we're going to talk about this morning, maybe we should just get it right. Engineer Sonny. Now, you can't vie for a position in the country unless you belong to a political party. We're yet to get clearance from the electoral act or whatever is going to help us or help an individual who has dreamed to make this country great again in his, his or own individual capacity to push for that dream. So, you have to belong to a political party. Prof yes. just said right now, not, nothing new, it's just it's resounded the fact that uh, the, 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 the politics in the country is highly monetized. And so the people who really want to serve may not even gain access to the position of authority in the country. How do we start to see uh, a change in this direction? Is it possible that we're able to restructure within ourselves as a people, whether by participation or whatever you have to say concerning this, such that political parties would have those people whose interest is not just about the monies they've invested, uh, but the people that they're supposed to care about. Engineer Sonny, I hope you got the question. Okay. Yeah, I, I, how, how can we manage to have a political parties playing their key role properly in the build of uh, you know, a viral and then uh, everlasting, you know, if you like, uh, democracy for Nigerians? Yes, uh, you know, I, I like what... Uh, uh, Professor Pati told me, you know, say that it's a state capture. And when you look at the background to all that, because you have to look at it from the background. Why, why, how did we get where we are today? You know, it's like, uh, I can liken it to what is happening to America today. You know, when America mistakenly, you know, you know, went to Afghanistan, you know, they thought might was right, that they can build a nation for them using their machinery and things like that. But they discovered that it's not possible. So they had to run away. You know, and then what, what have they left behind? A, a, a complete chaos, you know, situation that they've left behind, you know. They, so so that's what the military did to us. You know, they thought that, you know, they can come in and use the uh, barrack, you know, the mechanistic system of running affairs in the barracks and then bring it to the larger society and then uh, everybody will just, you know, uh, uh, whip, whip everybody to, to life and then democracy will be there or governance will be there. But we have discovered that it's not true. And at, until this moment, you know, if you look at even the experience of Abiola and the Tofa, it was still, you know, like Pat Utomi said, these were military apologists. You know, the, uh, Abiola was the best friend uh, of Babagida, uh, uh, who was in power then. So also was Tofa. So that's why it couldn't happen because it was an organized thing. You know, I don't like to call it organized crime against people, but that's the scene. It looks like that. So this is why democracy has been very difficult to develop in Nigeria because of the original sin. Of the military that came into the scene, they don't have those things that democracy, you know, demands, which is patience, which is understanding, which is the skills, you know, to ensure that you are able to use people by persuasion to grow the economy and then get a better life and then get the nation to move forward. That they failed woefully, you know. So this is why I am calling on people like Pato Tommy and others who say that you know the the. The, the intellectual came, came together and then chased the military out of power. So the intellectual still had a lot to do because what they have left behind is a chaos that we have to sort out, you know, and this is why political parties cannot be wished away. You know, we have to have them because otherwise there's no democracy if you don't have political parties. So we must come to terms with the reality of the situation and see how do we, like my colleague, you know, from Patakot was saying, that they are engaging with the, with the INEC, engaging with uh, people like Patakot himself, to ensure that we have a democracy system, a democratic system that will live up to expectation and be able to deliver, you know, for Nigerians. So I, I know that in my party, Action Democratic Party, we we have a lot of things for this country. Not because I'm here now that I'm trying to set the party, but it is true. That's why we call ourselves the credible alternative. Because you can't have a political party where only money talks. Yes, in politics, even in America, in Europe, wherever you have, you know, France, you know, money talks because you have to do the logistics and it took it costs money so money yes 
but not money to buy votes, not money to come and kill people, not money to buy INA, to buy police, to buy all these things. You know, this is what we are talking about. And we can do it if we put enough pressure on the government of the day to ensure that, you know, the right things are done. So political parties are realities in every democracy, no matter how you look at it, unless people are calling for autocracy, which I don't think that's what we want. So we must come to terms with reality of political parties. We must key in with them. We must in, you know, engage them, you know, the political party, so that those things that we believe are what democratic, the democratic party, I mean, political parties are supposed to represent, you know, are what you know they are doing. It's not a ragtag organization like ABC. People came together, they don't even know why they came together. The only thing they saw was how to occupy the state house. That's what they understood, that they will come and they, and they occupy it and they are distributing our, our trust, you know, among themselves. That's why we're in it. That's why we have the highest rate of poverty. We are discovered what capital of the, of the world today. You know, we have the banditry. In fact, I think we are more terrorized than even Afghanistan or, or any or Yemen or anything. The, the, this is the truth. I told you of a story of somebody being chased around in Asokoro, the, the high brow of a of, 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 you know, to be kidnapped. And then, and then so where, where, is, where is the security? Government has no right to authority unless you can provide security and where that's what the constitution says. And they have failed. So this is something that calls on people like Pato Toby and others to rise up to the occasion and engage with political parties so that we can engage with the grassroots and then get it right. Engineer, um, Engineer Sani, let, let's, let's speak with Bob Manuel there, on, still, still on, on this matter. Uh, Bob Manuel, I was having this conversation with Professor Pat just before the lights came on about um, uh, private sector involvement in determining uh, the ideas and the positions of political parties. Why do we, why does it seem like what we have today is the, the private sector, uh, the key players within the private sector, just take a back seat and allow the politicians to run. And at the end of the day, they come and make policies for you that are counterproductive to the workings of the business climate. Shouldn't we begin to see a key involvement of private sector players in, in determining uh, positions in political parties? I think that's a very um, informed question. You know, for us, from the point of view of the private sector, we've discovered that um, that has been the case, I have an issue. But um, we came to the only way for us to do this thing and get it right is to engage the system. And that's basically what we started out doing. And for the past eight years, as I said, consistently we've engaged the system from our, the, our space in Port Harcourt, in River State. And that has yielded a whole lot of dividends for us in the private sector. Because during part of those engagements, we went as far as the grassroots to reach out to the market unions, to reach out to affiliated different uh, organizations, informal sectors, formal and all of that. We've been able to form a nexus of understanding on what we need each and every government that comes into play to do for us and to address, to improve upon our ease of doing business in the state. And that formed the policy trust of what we use during our governorship debates. As I said, what that governorship, the debate we had, sorry, the debate we had brought about the current uh, set of uh, the current governor in the state. And in that communique that we came up with, we've been able to itemize what we think he should be able to achieve for the private sector from the point of view of the markets how to develop upon the market, the informal sectors, how to harmonize the taxes in the state and so on. And it has worked tremendously. And we think the next thing we're doing now is to see how we could blow it up into the, the into the center, the meaning the, the federal, to see how we could translate the successes we've been able to achieve from where we are in the central. And I will tell you, the fact that the private sector seem to have been aloof from this system, we're not being we are we're not advocating for the private sector to come and take government no our responsibility in, in an economy in a democracy as like ours is to have true uh, what do you call um, representation of our views and whenever the representation of our views are carried into context you find out that we would only then be able to achieve true diversification of the nigerian economy and the burn of nigerian issues centers around the diversification of our economy. And if we could achieve diversification of the Nigerian economy, then the private sector would have the free role to play. Because 
questions like why would you want to spend as much as the amount of money you're spending in sectors like the railways and so on and so forth when you have a very vibrant private sector that could actually fill in on all of those spaces because those spaces are major cash cows for the country and if the private sector is very much organized and have a united and understanding, better understanding of what the private sector needs to play. Then you find out that you begin to see a scenario whereby the private sector would engage the political parties. Now that brings us back to the policy trust of the various political parties. The political parties must stand on ideology. They must go back to the ideology. If they don't understand, if they don't have an ideology, they, then they could at will could wink the people of the country and do whatever they like and go for free. But when they have an ideology and that ideology is properly communicated to the people and the people have taken out time to engage those ideologies of the various political parties, then they make a more informed, uh, what you call deal or more informed uh, voting process for the average man on the street. And when they make those informed uh, voting, uh, vote, voting their processes and voting decisions, you find out that they begin to wait and ask the political parties. When you get into office, you just are in, you do, voted you into office and you promised in the next one year, X, Y, Z would be achieved. And if X, Y, Z is not achieved, they begin to start that engagement process. But if they don't have that buy-in, there's absolutely no way that we can actually bequit ourselves through democracy in the country. Thank so you, that's the Thank process you, that is done. We're all part of it, and we need to achieve that. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Professor Pato told me, I'm sure you really want to talk on private sector you know, participation, <laughs> but some people will always ask, when we say pub, uh, private sector participation and organized private sector, it's always been a question around it that when you say organized private sector or the private sector engaging the political parties to ensure that the policies that are you know, brought forward when they win elections will be to the advantage of the electorate and not just their own. Well, um, let me take a very platform view of this uh, conversation. First of all, let me compliment uh, Bob Manuel and uh, the people in Port Harcourt for the effort that they are making. Um, but you see, it's so much more basic. In 1985, the Aga Khan Foundation sponsored a conference in Nairobi on uh, what is called a tripartite approach to development. Uh, this means that a way of getting the public sector, the private sector, and social enterprise sector, in those days they used to call them private development agencies, yeah. NGO sector, yeah. to find a collaborative way of bringing development and growth for people. When that conference ended, the Nigerian participants from these three sectors got together. The private sector was led at the time by the chief executive of UAC of Nigeria, Chief Ernest Shoneko. Um, the public sector was led by the PAMSEC in the Minister of Finance, Alaji Abubakar Alaji. The pub, uh, private sector was led by Dr. Jack. And out of these conversations, a major was called an enabling environment forum. It is an enabling environment forum that transmuted into the Nigerian Economic Summit Group. Mm -hmm. But we have not been effective in that whole effort for a variety of reasons, in my opinion. I mean, we were the founders of all of these groups. And part of it is that the Nigerian private sector takes a very weak view of its role and allows government to think that it, you know, this is its platform, we tell you, you know. And because, unfortunately, I think too many businessmen do government business. Mm. They are not able and willing to speak truth to power. The compromise, do you mean? I, I mean, I'm just reading a book on all of this, which I talk about the complicit middle. In many ways, the private sector is more complicit in our problems than the government people. Mm. Because the watch government people don't say anything to them as they are misbehaving. They uh, actually, where they should do something, they say, mm, let's leave them alone. You know, you, you, I'll solve my own problems. I can buy my generator, I can buy. Yeah. And so a group of people who don't know what they are doing, because they have been, quote unquote, elected or they've stolen votes and come into public authority, now hold a, a stage. Uh, the whole system hostage. That needs to change. 
the private sector person has as much right as the person in government. It's his country. They both own the country equally. And so they cannot continue. Look, I have served at the apex of all the private sector, National Council of Man, uh, NECA, uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce. I know this game. Look, when we were in the Council of Man 30 something years or so ago, um, there was a major problem of multiple taxation. We had a big meeting, or not one big meeting, continuous meetings. It was a recurring issue at the National Council of Man. And the president of Man was mandated, and he was very friendly with the vice president at the time, to tell the vice president to do something, um, you know. And uh, I was friendly with the vice president myself. Uh, uh, so I was arriving to visit the vice president one evening, <coughs> And the president of MAN was leaving. So when I got in, I said to Melai uh, Kumu, I hope he told you about our problems. And this is, he said, which problem? You know, I was so really angry. Then I started telling him about all the conversations we had and what was supposed to, you know. The very next week, and you know, put this in perspective, Raji Rasaki, General Rasaki was governor in Lagos, who I was also very friendly with. I stopped by. To, to see him. And I said to him, look, our people from the chamber were supposed to have talked to you about this. Uh, he said, leave those your people. They came here and were asking for, for land in Lek. Misplaced priority. Yeah. So there's a problem in our country mm. of values. And it pervades both the public and private sectors. And we need to purge ourselves of these things mm. if we're going to heal our country. Uh, prof, Prof, can't we begin to look at it from a perspective where before the leaders are elected, the roles of the private sector. In other words, shouldn't we begin to look at them getting involved in decision makings in parties, getting into party, I mean partisan uh, politicking and begin to make key decisions going forward? There are different ways that you can structure this. Look, in a country like Mauritius, which has done so much much better, it's probably the most competitive economy on the continent of Africa. In Mauritius, the discussion in the Chamber of Commerce is more important than the one in their parliament. When the chamber decides, literally, the parliament adopts the position of the chamber. And this is why we all made a lot of noise about Agoa. Turned out to be a Mauritius that made a fortune from Agoa. Yeah. We couldn't do anything because the private sector and their conversations were driving the decisions that the government was making. And so I think that what we need is an education of all people who participate in public life to understand their roles and what really leads to progress. And I think Bob Manuel repeatedly talked about it, lack of diversification of the base of our economy. Yeah. I mean, it is not possible. I mean, for 30 years, the recurring line, almost like copied from less budget in the budget speech, is to diversify the uh, base of the monocultural, yeah. and it's like a song. Yes. And every year, nothing really happens. We should have had champions all along. We should have had a national strategy. Look at smaller countries that tried those things and where they got to. Why couldn't we do it? We have the intellectual power. But politics in Nigeria became anti-intellectual. Yeah. If you think you are dangerous, and you, they push you away. Yeah. You know, the first day, the first meeting they have is, let's prevent Patutomi from or something like that, you know, mm. coming anywhere near here. And this is where, why we are where we are. Deng Xiaoping saved a great country called China. Mm. Because the way we behave now was the way the apparatchiks behaved under Mao in China. China. And China was stagnated. Half Nigeria's GDP per person. Mm. Deng, go and read the series of speeches he made in 1978. We must make knowledge, intellect, the basis of our party. We must give pride of place to people of knowledge and intellect. 30 years on, one generation, in China's GDP is 30 times that of Nigeria. Yeah. So amazing. I think that we need to learn a few things if we don't want to keep hurting our children's children. You know, and that's what the problem is. I mean, it's, it can be very heart wrenching sometimes when you see things that are going on, even as young as some of us are, and you look back and see things that are taking place while you're growing up, and the expectations you had of your country, and you see things seemingly falling apart 
right in your face. Um, Mr. Bob Manuel, let's talk about the fact that you can talk about political party, ideologies, private sector, about anything without the human beings. We talked about the citizens now. Let's talk about citizens' engagement. Uh, political part parties are not just um, edifices. They, they are political parties because people engage in politicking. The quality of people that involve themselves in politics in the country. I'm still, I still have a question for uh, Professor uh, Patterson because I knew that he wanted to invite to be uh, president. He was invited to be president. He also uh, was on the bid to be a governor of his state. And uh, one would have thought that people like him and others who had always been outspoken on the way that Nigeria and the state should go uh, should be able to you know, deliver on their promises if elected into office. The crop of people that involve themselves in politics you and I can come and talk about and criticize, but we don't really engage in politics. I'm not talking about you in particular because I know you're doing a lot. How do we start to talk to electorates on the need for citizens' involvement in the country's polity? Well, um, I, I didn't get major part of your question, but um, I think you're talking about um, how do we get citizens' um, involvement into the process of um, politicking, I don't know, something around that. You're right. Well, what we, what we are basically doing, we have found out that um, the echo space where we play as um, private sector players, we'll find out that um, we have a chunk, a major chunk of the electorate in that same um, echo space. But the space seems to be um, alienated and the space is very comfortable at the alienated states, meaning they don't want to get involved, just like what Pat just yeah. said. They don't want to get involved. They don't want to ruffle any feathers. They don't want to um, um, stir the teacup. Uh, they just want to concentrate and do what they're doing. But we're, we're saying that, look, we need to go one step beyond where we are. Yes, we're private sector players, but if we don't get the, 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 the governance right, if we don't get the best set of people at the helm of affairs, obviously it would eventually come around to haunt us. That's basically what it is, because the wrong set of policies are going to be thrown up and we're going to be the first line charge of the people that those wrong policies are going to extinguish out of the space. And that's why we have been able to, what we're trying to do is mass enlightenment of our people from different parts of the, 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 the private sector, from the MSMEs to the SMEs to the big conglomerates and all of that. Because if we get the right set of people in, gov in government, then at the same time, basically how do we intend to get the right set of people? We're not going to join, we're not encouraging to join political parties, even if it's not a wrong idea. But we basically just need to enlighten our base to make a more informed voting decision. We need to get our base to understand that their participation in the electoral process through voting is their civil right and it's important for their job because it's going to protect their job. If a scenario whereby you have the right set of policies, like prior to this time in, in our space, we used to have issues around multiplication of taxes. And we saw that as a major problem that is extinguishing a lot of jobs and a lot of our businesses. And we came around and we discussed and told ourselves we need to address it frontally. And how did we address it frontally? We started in engaging these political parties to come up with their manifesto in the state and to tell us what they intend to do to address this multiplication of taxes in our system. And true to type, during the debates, the different governor, governorship candidates came up with those policies that they intend to implement. And after the debate, we got them to sit down and sign a communique agreeing that these were the high points of these issues that we raised from the private sector and these are the ways they're going to address it i'll give you a simple scenario in that in the first debate we had for eight years ago, about um the, the, the yeah, about six years ago in that debate before we stood out of that debate the political gladiators agreed and signed to such uh, communique where they said immediately they finish and they get to they get elected. They were going to open the courts because you remember so at that time, courts in River State were shut down for about two years. And true to type, the candidate that won, immediately he won. The first thing he did on a Saturday, if I'm not mistaken, he went from the from the air from the the place where he was sworn in, to the courts, to go and open the doors of the courts. We had scenarios whereby 
taxes were being hounded on a daily basis in River State where businesses can't really afford to run the businesses smoothly because different sets of people from the different local government, state government coming up with the same set of taxes and all of that, which was not business friendly. We discussed and that same issues were signed out. And today we have some kind of semblance of um, fresh air on that space. So we need to translate this because the private sector has a key role to play in this whole electioneering process. Because going by the statistics we're looking at, the private sector has a minimum of 40% of the electorates that eventually should be able to impact upon the overall the, the system to, call, to, to, to be able to throw up the kind of leadership that we intend. If today a single private sector player like Dan Gote could afford to invest as much as $30 billion in the set of investments that is, is putting up in, uh, in Becky. It simply means that our private sector have come of age. And if the private sector have come of age, we need to begin to throw our weights around the amount of influence we have from the private sector point of view. We need to begin to sit down with the government and educate them sit down with the public sector, educate them on what they need to do to be able to drive revenue. We shouldn't be in the position where we are today, where you find out that the, the what you call the federal government is spending as much as it's spending on the railway sector. You can't afford to spend as much of that money on the railway sector when you don't have the simple managerial skills to run a railway, effective railway system all around the world. The private sector is the ones are the ones that are supposed to run such spaces. Now you look at the for for uh, in as much as we're giving the, a knock to to the system, we should look at the high point, the, the 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 good side of the system. You have an aviation sector where the aviation minister is encouraged is is being encouraged to privatize that space, and that's the only way to go about it. When the aviation space is privatized and the government plays the role of uh, what you call the policy implementation and policy trust, uh, guiding the growth of such into such spaces so that the private sector does not exploit or make too much profit out of the system. That's the only way the system becomes efficient. And when it becomes efficient, it's open for further private participation and for further private investment in such spaces. So we need to go back to the basics. And the basics, just like we've all agreed, we need to begin to interrogate the government, the, the political parties, to come up with the ideology. We need to see the ideology. And not just them coming up with the ideology. We need to interrogate those ideology and drive those ideology policies trust to the grassroots, to our people. Because look, if a political party that is being voted into power don't have the right policy for the people, it simply means our jobs and our investments are going to be extinct. All of those are going to be extinct. People will lose their jobs. These are the issues that we should be looking at. And for us as a private sector, it doesn't necessarily mean that for us as a private sector, we need to go and join political parties and start running political campaigns. No. We're, we're technocrats. We're, we're comfortable in our spaces. And we have our legitimate role that we're supposed to play in every economy. And that is what matters. What is our role to play in those economies are to create jobs. And what is the role? for the public sector is for the public sector to come up with policies that would guide and protect the system so that the private sector does not eventually monopolize and eventually outlive or outuse their potentials that they have in the system. So these are the issues. So the private sector has where we're shoulder to shoulder with the politicians and the political parties in bequeathing a proper, uh, what do you call, the society for ourselves. So these are the issues that we need to look at. These are the issues that we need to begin to interrogate the, the political parties and the people in power today. These are the issues we need to look at. Thank you. But Mano, fantastic work um, uh, the forum seems to have done in Port Harcourt River State, uh, which is what we are seeing in, in this state uh, going forward. But we're looking at how we can replicate these on the national, on the national scale. Uh, let's come back to Professor Pat to tell me um, on this conversation. Um, Pat, maybe I should, I, should, I should digress a little bit. Uh, because time is running out and I, mm -hmm. I would be doing myself a lot of injustice if I don't ask you uh, mm -hmm. this question. You did say there was an unveiling of, uh, of a coalition. Uh, over the weekend. Okay, there, yes. yeah, there's an initiative that is going on because you see, many times we talk and we don't act. We must act. It is also in line with, with this conversation we have yes. right now. Getting, give, you know, 
a part of what we have been doing uh, is brainstorming on how to, to save things. Uh, about 2012 or thereabouts, the leadership newspaper in his annual lecture series had one on political parties. I was privileged to be the one who gave the lecture. Um, interestingly, most of the people who now constitute the leadership of the APC from the president, uh, um, Senator Bolatinubu, Chief Akonde, all of them were present you know, at this lecture in, in Abuja. And it was a very impassioned presentation that went back to the 1911 thoughts of Roberto Michels on political parties, then looked at how political parties have evolved and all of that, and what a political party must be. I remember when I finished, uh, Dr. Paul Unongo ran up to me and said, I wish I could just lock the doors and prevent all of you from leaving this place until you do what you have just said for Nigeria. Well, eventually one party came out of that whole process. It's called the APC. It just didn't do what we said mm. political parties should do. And since then we've been thinking, how do we make political parties work for Nigeria? And part of the process that we've come through is to try and see if we can develop people who can, one, go into the current parties and try and reform them from within. Mm -hmm. I know how hard I tried. I know how difficult that was mm -hmm. because the system was just machines. It was not interested in doing things. You know, I was just, we've got power. What do we do for ourselves? Um, create one or two new parties that are real political parties that takes into account all of those things that I outlined in that lecture. And we've begun the process. A couple of the current political parties are going to fuse into one uh, with the ADC as its base. And the ideology is already set out. They are a center-left uh, party focused on entrepreneurial capitalism that is going to look to empower the people to produce their way out of poverty. Because the challenge with Nigeria is these guys who run Nigeria today they just rent people. They just want, that's why they've not diversified the base of the economy. Mm -hmm. They only see rent coming, you know, oil revenues, who gets the most share of the revenue. But they don't understand that no country in history has become rich from revenues. The only thing that makes rich is production. Mm -hmm. So how do you create a production-based economy? And this is part of the set of planks of the party, this one party. I mean, the idea... For me personally, I mean, a group of us working this from different directions is two parties, create two new parties that are real yeah. political parties, not uh, election machines. Yeah. Uh, but many favor one. In the end, we'll see which comes out, whether it's one or two parties. But ensure that whatever it is that comes out are real parties with issues that affect the lives of everyday people, with the people empowered. The second thing, these parties should be funded by the people. people you pay your 1,000 Naira every month so that your country can be better run. Right now, if you wait for somebody to bring 10 billion, which is what happens with these organizations, and by the way, it's a state money. Mm. They should all be in jail. They take the money off the state and they put in a party and they use it to capture the state. And the country doesn't make any progress. But if we can make the people, through crowdfunding, run their political parties, own them, then you can hold the people who go into public office, who you would have, first of all, selected people of competence and character. Then you hold them accountable. And that's how you achieve what other countries achieve. But when a man sells his house in London or wherever it is they have these things, and uses it to secure a party and wins election. His first thought is to recoup his investment. Yeah. And he's not going to recoup just the amount he invested. He's going to recoup with multiples. With profits. And then he's done, there's nothing left to serve the people. So this is what we are trying to change. This is, uh, it's, uh, I mean, uh, it's very stressful. That's, I, I use that freely because mm -hmm. when, when you look at the, the, the quality of people that Nigeria you know, produces every day, not only even people of your own stature, Pato Tomi, and in fact, uh, Mr. Bob Marley, all over the world, even the young people, when you see 
uh, Nigerians in the Committee of Nations, what Nigerians are doing, it would, it would be so disheartening to see what is going on around and that we can't, we don't seem to be able to change, turn around all these great blessings that we have to our advantage. So, sticking with the political parties today and seeing how we can, the electorate can, if need be, force the political parties to come up with clear-cut uh, ideologies that they can easily relate to, not manifestos or anything that's so big. Let, let's say that is in closing. How do we achieve this before 2023? Okay, Mr. Mr. Bob Manuel, uh, I think the network there is, isn't fine. So the, the question comes to you, Prof. Yes. How do we as a people really it, it, redirect this country? It, it can be done. The thing is to all become committed massively. I give the example of England and what happened in the UK. Uh, in the late 1700s, Lazy Fair Britain was something like this, you know, but it was productive and all of that. But the capitalists captured the state and the people were suffering. You know, if you read Charles Dickens, mm. uh, you know, Tale of Two Cities, even the church kicked in. Pope Leo XIII wrote the encyclical Rerum Novarum to deal with the problems created by that era. A group of intellectuals in the UK began to think, how can we intervene? Yeah. Because they were threatened, they used to meet in, in the back of beer parlors. They became friendly with uh, women who ran pubs so that they could meet in the back. So they were thought of as drunkards. They didn't know that they, they behind of the Talibans. pubs they were having these meetings and all of that. And then they thought of strategy. And the strategy that appealed to them was one used by a Roman general called Fabius Quintus Maximus who took on Hannibal of Carthage with his great army. Realizing that he couldn't take on this massive army, they decided that they would just do a massive, you know, chipping away from every direction. Mm. Educating the people, doing that. The groups decided to call themselves the Fabians. That's how Fabian socialism came. From out there, they created a school that would be the source of the ideas for what they were talking about. That school is the London School of Economics oh. and Political Science. Wow. And they created a political party. That party is the Labour Party. It is possible for us to do the same thing to save Nigeria. And that's what we are trying to do now. We're not talking anymore. There's a platform. This week, we're going to have Nigerians fund this process. We're going to put out uh, uh, whatever it is, websites and all of that. If you want, give 10 naira every month or every whatever but we're going to create these kinds of organizations that will ensure that we select the people of the right qualities yeah. to be the people who run the parties and run the process mm -hmm. seek public office fund them with the people's resources and get them to be held accountable to deliver a better quality of life for the Nigerian people. I, I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait to see that happen. Excited, excitedly. I mean, we we are we're expecting something new. Uh, I, I'm sure. I'm sure every Nigeria wants something new. Uh, we've been longing for something new for for decades right now, and yeah. we're really hoping that um, we can just get it right at this point in time. If we see have uh, Bob Manuel in Port Harcourt. Uh, we oh, fortunately, we have, we have, we have we've, we've lost contact. Well, thank you so very much, Bob Manuel, for your time. And thank you also, Engineer. Oh, thank you. Yes, I'm sure you can hear me. Uh, thank uh. you for your time with <laughs> us on the show. We, yeah. we, we apologize. We apologize. We, we can't take any more conversation. How time flies when you're having a beautiful time. Thank you so very much uh, for your time with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And Prof, uh, yeah, it's such a wonderful time having you live in the studio. Um, thank you. We appreciate your input. We appreciate your intellectual uh, uh, contributions to every conversation. Uh, where you match politics and economics, I wonder what else uh, we should expect from you. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Professor Pasatomi. It's a great pleasure. Yeah. 
All right. Um, so many questions I still have for Prof, but of course not today. We hope to bring him back on this, on this platform or any other platform, and then he can answer the questions. Let the week start with you thinking of what you can do for your country, not because it's something I'm bringing from one a very, very special person that had, you know, said so many years ago, but because without us, this country can't stand. You and I, I'm talking about you. Uh, we are the leaders in the making, the leaders that we have up there, wearing drawn from other countries, but within Nigeria. So let's start preparing to make Nigeria great again. I'm Shil Oyedej, wishing you a beautiful week. And I am David Ubabudike. Have yourself a profitable business and a very safe week. Bye for now.